What's up? Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Basket Show. My name is Kevan Davani, the Total Connector. Uh, you know, there can never be enough educational, inspirational, empathizing um, materials out there. So I was really happy to um, somehow, you know, uh, follow Jimbo, his pseudonym name, who authored the book, is, which has not been published yet, The Orange Coin Good, The Value of Bitcoin. So eventually uh, he will publish it sometime, hopefully in the near future. But um, yeah, make sure you feel, follow him on Twitter. It's uh, Jimbo Coin. And I'm going to put those in the show notes. So, yeah, without further ado, uh, we're going to, you know, talk about a bunch of things uh, about, um, you know, how the future is going to look like for humanity. What will life look like uh, with Bitcoin? Uh, what are the concrete, you know, visions, ideas, and yeah, and a bunch of other, you know, down the rabbit hole questions. So make sure you follow me. You uh, tweet it, retweet it, share it, subscribe to my channel, please. YouTube podcast platforms. Thank you so much again, and without further ado, this is my talk with Jimbo, and let me know your questions afterwards. Thank you. All right, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Botki Show. My very special guest for the first time is Jimbo. That's his uh, pseudonym, uh, or uh, yeah, I guess a pseudonym name. Uh, Jimbo, how are you doing? Thanks, thanks for your time. Welcome to the show. I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Um, listen, I mean, I, I, um, I've, I've actually recently stumbled upon, you know, your work, uh, and I didn't know that you had even written. We have we've been following f uh, each other for quite some time, but I didn't know that you had written a book. But just to make things clear, so you're the author of Orange Coin Good: The Value of Bitcoin, but you haven't published it yet, right? That is correct. It is not available anywhere. Yeah. So thanks again for you know giving me this uh, opportunity to read your book. It's really excellent for whatever you call it, pre-coiner, no-coiner, even a Bitcoiner, just to recapitulate, reflect upon you know the essence, properties, and the fundamentals, and the, the you know and the power of Bitcoin. Um, let's just start off you know from the scratch. Why did you write this book? You know why why do we need a Bitcoin? <laughs> what's what's your yeah. path to that before that? Oh sure. So uh, there's a couple of questions there. There's my uh, rabbit hole story, which I'm happy to talk about. It's um, not really much different than anybody else. So I feel like everyone kind of goes through the same uh, steps. The very first thing that happens is you hear about Bitcoin and you say, well, and then a long time passes and nothing happens. And then you hear about it again. And it's like, wow, that scam's still around. No way, maybe it's not a scam. But usually the second time you hear about it, it's because the price recently, recently crashed off of some all-time high, and you're like, well, even if it's not a scam, it's too late. I missed out. Then another long time passes, then you hear about it again, and you're like, wow, it's still around. And now you have the opportunity to actually fall into the rabbit hole or not. And so mine was no different. Um, I first heard about Bitcoin sometime sometime before late 2011, because I know what job I was at when I heard about it. And uh, out of my arrogance, I didn't read the white paper. I just thought it was a scam. Um, I didn't hear about it again until sometime in 2012 when it was coming off of the $30 peak. And I said, wow, maybe this scam isn't going to go anywhere. Maybe I should look into this, but I don't want to be the sucker that's buying it on the way down. So I can't, I can't spend $9 on a Bitcoin. That's, that sounds kind of ridiculous. Um, and then uh, I watched it go up and up and up. And then I started looking into it more deeply. And it, uh, I bought my first Bitcoin on Mt. Gox um, for $127. And then I sold it two days later for $135 and thought I was a genius because I had made 8% 8, 8 or whatever. Yeah, but so, what was what was the year? The first time you uh, you ever like got aware of of Bitcoin and you started like becoming you know conscious of it and understanding that you know the fundamentals. Um, sure. So that was probably more that was probably more twenty seventeen. So after um, after uh, losing some money on Mt. Gox and uh, you know I still look forward to hearing from the trustee. Maybe eventually I'll see some of that back. Um, but it wasn't until 2017 when we hit new all-time highs in early 2017, and that that was that was what convinced me that uh, the Mt. Gox collapse was not the death of Bitcoin. It wasn't just going to go away slowly, but rather it was never going to go away. And so I had full commitment at that point, even before I started researching the properties of it. I didn't run my first node until the uh, the BIP 148 UASF um, fork proposal. Right. Uh, um, that was kind of when I first started into it. So you asked about like why I decided to write a book. It didn't start out as a book. What started out was I was doing, I was falling into the rabbit hole and doing all this research and I wanted to just explain to my colleagues what I had found. And so I started to write what I thought was going to be a newsletter 
Um, but it just got longer and longer as I discovered more things that I felt like people needed to understand. So I started, I just switched over to book mode and then the book was getting longer and longer and I realized it was going to end up being about 600 pages to say everything I, I felt people needed to understand. And I said, nobody's going to read a 600 page book. So my, my book, <laughs> my book the, yeah, exactly. So my book, the value of Bitcoin, then I said, okay, what, what can I, how can I break this down into a series where I can say something cohesive um, for the audience of the time first and then do that in four steps. And so um, my current plan, which I have not deviated from as far as I know, is uh, to write a four book series, the first of which is called Orange Coin Good. Um, and that's, as you mentioned, it's for pre-coiners. It's to explain the proper, the, it's to explain, it's really to answer one question. The question is, how can some, how can a purely digital money have any value to people at all? Like if it's not backed by anything, how can it have any value? Um, and so that's the, really the question that I'm trying to answer in, in this first book. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, so the title is Orange Coin Good, the value of Bitcoin, or the uh, main title is Orange Coin Good. Now, you've, wrote, you've written, uh, you know, pretty interesting um, chapters, um, which I want to go into partially to them because uh, we're not going to have time to go through all of them. But let's say, um, let's let's start with the, you know, with the with the main question in, in part one, why do we need Bitcoin? Uh, where you explain, you know, why is this fiat money, green paper money, as you call it, bad? And, you know, why we need good money? And you go down the rabbit hole. And then in the fourth sub chapter of part one, you, you talk about meeting the people of Bitcoin. Now, there must have been a path before that meeting people also who have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Like, I'm really curious, like, what is your encounter, your experiences with people who are, what, you, what do you want to call them, like pre-coiners or no-coiners, or like totally skeptical, doubtful, fearful? Um, what is your experience with people in your environment? That's a really great, that's a really great question. Um, the, the frame, okay, so to, to step back a second, the frame that I like to use to try to uh, to try to group people as far as who, who you might be talking to. There's really kind of three, I refer to them as blue team, red team, and orange team. So there are three clusters. Our, our, at least in the United States, our political environment has been collapsed down to a, a bipolar, like a single, a single axis, right? You're either left or you're right, right? It's blue team or red team. Um, but there's really a third group, which I call orange team, which is the Bitcoiners. And they really haven't had a home but people tend to fall into one of these three categories. Um, the reason why I the reason why I uh, why I categorize it this way is because uh, I've done a lot of research on on people. I okay, so I started <laughs> I started by studying money back in the mid two thousands, and I felt like I had a pretty good understanding of money. And then I switched over to studying people. And when I was trying to understand how people work, I came across Jonathan Haidt's excellent uh, moral foundations theory, which gives these. Um, different moral proclivities people have in various degrees. And then based on their moral proclivities, they tend to cluster into these three groups. So as it pertains to discussing Bitcoin with folks, people who are already orange teamers, people who are already kind of libertarian leaning in their sentiment, people who are already pro-freedom, they'll kind of get it pretty quickly. And their, their major concern is, well, how, why not gold? Well, how, you know, gold's been around for thousands of years. You know, this thing seems kind of new. That's kind of their major, that's their major pushback. Um, for folks that are not in that case, at least here in the, the, the place where I live, I find that a lot of the pushback has to do with, well, the existing fiat currency works pretty well for me. Like I, my credit cards work fine. My bank account works fine. Why would I use anything else? And you know, that, that I think is a, um, it's a reasonable critique, but I also think of it kind of like dial up internet. So the United States pioneered uh, in a large degree, the widespread distribution of dial-up internet because we had phone lines and so we had AOL, we had all these things. But then we were last in line to adopt high-speed internet. So other countries got cable and um, DSL and these other technologies. So we got we kind of got leapfrogged and it wasn't until America then had to play catch up with Europe and the other parts of the world uh, that had those other better internet technologies. So I think the same things, this is my just my own prediction, is that the same thing will probably happen with uh, fiat currencies. So the United States, the people who live in the United States have some of the best banking services available. Everybody wants US dollars. People have good banks and, you know, there's a lot of um, 
integrated credit cards and whatnot. And so for them, there's not a lot of impetus to switch to something new. Meanwhile, other places in the world do have a much more pressing need to switch and they'll leapfrog the United States. So anyway, it's kind of a rambling answer. I'm sorry for, uh, for going on off. Of, off no, no, there. no, that's, that's excellent. That, that's really important to me. Like, uh, because it, you know, it boils down to the question, why would people, I'm always trying to empathize with people like why, why, why would people even consider Bitcoin? Like what, what are we trying to achieve here? And, and um, it became really thrilling um, <laughs> um, at the end of your book, the last paragraph of your book. This is why I, I you know, I, I took, I, I deliberately picked the title of our episode um, and I actually quoted you in that, um, you know, how will life look like, um, you know, in um, um, how would how would be how would life be different for people with Bitcoin? And that's the fundamental question for me, because I'm like, how can we translate what, you know, whatever we're doing, you know, educational wise, there's so many tons of podcasts, articles, books, Twitter, I mean, Twitter Bitcoin is a, you know, a, a, a huge eco chamber for itself. But uh, my question is, are we reaching, you know, the 95 or 99 percent of the people out there? How can we, you know, most efficiently in a most empathizing way, translate that knowledge or, you know, um, make it more uh, visualized, like like to comprehend, it's a comprehension process. Uh, because it's one thing to understand, you know, the root causes, the why, you know, uh, why do we have all these symptoms, monetary wise, economical wise, socially, structurally, but okay, what's the solution then? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I, I'm, I am, con I have concluded that Bitcoin will win. I, I don't see any way that it won't. People ask sometimes, like, what, what would be a threat to Bitcoin? And every time I try to imagine a threat to Bitcoin, um, I come up with some way that I or others would work to mitigate that threat. I, I, I like uh, the expression decentralized has become a little bit overloaded. So I prefer to say that Bitcoin is anti-centralizing. It treats centralization attempts like damage and then routes around them. I think the, the UASF was a, kind of a canonical example. People had tried to co-opt Bitcoin. And the users of Bitcoin said, nope, we're just going to, we're going to make this the way we want it to be, um, irrespective of that. So Bitcoin is anti-centralizing. So the only, the only thing that I could imagine would, would break Bitcoin, which would also break basically everything else, would be a heretofore undiscovered zero-day attack on ECDSA signatures. If you could crack very quickly ECDSA signatures, then the ledger would be suspect people would be able to potentially move funds, you know, uh, or from, I won't go into the details too much. I don't know how much your audience wants to hear about it, but um, in an environment where ECDSA has been cracked, you run into situations where you might be trying to spend your Bitcoin, you put a transaction out on the, on the wire, and then in front of you, somebody front runs that by cracking your key and then putting a higher fee thing that steals your money, right? So th that's the only thing I can think of. But if you crack ECDSA, virtually all other cryptography that we rely on for the internet also breaks at the same time. So that's the only thing I can think of. And the reason why that's the only thing I can think of is because anything else, anything else would preserve the ledger. So, you know, Bitcoin is at its heart, uh, this ledger of, of, of effectively numbered accounts, right? People, I know the account model doesn't um, perfectly work, but you have all these um, pseudonymous accounts that it's kind of like a spreadsheet. It's kind of like a big database and everybody's got a copy, everybody who runs a node. I have a copy that I keep on a, a micro SD card in my wallet. So I just, I have a copy at all times of the full history of the blockchain minus since the last time I synchronized it. So I, I don't see any way for Bitcoin to lose. So if Bitcoin's going to win, then back to your question, I know, I know you asked about like, how do you, how do you make the future better? The best way that I can figure out to make the future better is to help people understand and adopt this technology more smoothly so that it doesn't have to win violently, so that people can adopt it as, you know, in pieces rather than it being forced upon them when their system that they're in collapses. Um, it's effectively like, it's like an exit, like you're, you're, you're exiting the, the previous collapsing system, which I think is so, showing strains. Uh, I, think, I think the coronavirus has kind of um, illustrated a lot of the underlying uh, problems that otherwise were not necessarily on the surface. But 
So I, the, the thing that I'm trying to do for people is to try to find a way to communicate with um, people who are not necessarily young and libertarian minded, because those folks, I think, get it pretty quickly. Um, but it's everybody else who needs a little help. Um, yeah, um, um, Jimbo, so are you, in, from your background, are you like more technical or economical? Can I ask you that? I mean, uh, what's Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's a fine question. Um, I'm, uh, by trade, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I went, I got a regular old BS of CS uh, from a regular old American university and I, I produce software. Um, my specialty is uh, kind of front end work, but I've also done work on databases and that sort of thing. Um, as I said, I started studying money uh, back in the mid 2000s. Uh, I haven't, I don't have any classical training on economics uh, or anything like that, but. Did uh, you read Austrian economics, like anything literature? Because I haven't done it, I mean, until a few years ago, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So the time period from when I fell into the rabbit hole, notwithstanding uh, what I had read prior to that, um, I had read Creature from Jekyll Island. I had read um, some of some of Tom Wood's works uh, on explaining the meltdown, uh, th those sorts of things. But not, but not. I, I hadn't read the rich tradition of, say, Rothbard or, uh, you know, Mises or any of that stuff by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a lot of conversations or in other podcasts or interviews I've had it. It's this talk about like becoming a Bitcoiner or coming into the Bitcoin space. It's um, it's essentially all about you know becoming liberated. You know, it's freedom uh, principles, living the uh, you know principles of freedom, and of course self responsibility and self sovereignty. Do you think you know to become like self responsible? Like, do does one need like a does one need to be like over cautious, like super cautious, super paranoid a little bit, uh, or a little bit more, you know, fearful, not fearful, but like, uh, you know, much, much more careful uh, than you would be in, you know, in this matrix? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a really good point. Um, Bitcoin is unforgiving of mistakes. So if you, um, if you lose your seed and then also you lose your computer, then you lose your funds. Your funds are gone. Uh, so to your point, yes, you do have to be more cautious. Um, I think I think a lot, I mean, I'm just spitballing here. I, risk is endemic. You can't, you can't get rid of risk. It exists. You can move it around. You can uh, collect it, right? So an insurance company collects risk. They say, well, the, the risk to a single individual is catastrophic if they run into some sort of an issue. So we're going to pool all that risk together. And then for us, it's not a big deal when somebody has a catastrophic issue for them because we can pay that out because most people don't have that issue, right? So insurance companies pool risk, but the risk is still there. The risk of catastrophic loss still exists. It's just that it's been handled in a different way. So I think that uh, the same would probably be true in a Bitcoin future. And we all choose what, we all choose what level of work we want to do for ourselves and what level we want uh, to have someone else do for us. So when you go out to eat, you're, 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 um, you're outsourcing your cooking. Somebody else is cooking for you, right? So we don't, you know, most people uh, eat out sometimes and sometimes they make food at their, at their home. Nobody is kind of all one or all the other, but almost nobody makes their own shoes. People outsource that to shoemakers who make shoes and then they buy them. So when it comes to Bitcoin and sovereignty and the, the handling of one's um, finances, people will make their own choices there too. You can either handle that yourself or you can outsource it to someone else. The risk, of course, if you outsource the handling of your money to someone else is that now it's their money, right? So I would make an argument that of all realms of life, handling one's own money would be one something that people should uh, try to educate themselves. But I also think that there's a big, there's a lot of opportunity for improving the user experience. There's no reason why it has to be as complicated as it is. Um, I mean, we're kind of early days in terms of the, the experience of, uh, of managing one's um, key material. So. Okay, so are you of the opinion that uh, UX, user experience, you know, the ease of use, this, you know, the smoothness, the smooth experience is still lacking? Like if we are, as if we are dealing like whatever emails, uh, computer, internet, do you think, I mean, do you think we have still to, to go a long way until we have that critical adoption process where people just don't even think about it? They, it's just a natural thing to do? Like, or, 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of space that we could do better. So, in order, <clears throat> the the existing the existing financial infrastructure relies on outsourcing your risk. So you use a credit card, and then you rely on the credit card company to manage the um, security of that network. It's not your network to secure; it's their network. If you lose your credit card number, it gets co-opted, they'll make you whole again. So they're also acting as kind of insurer against your funds. So they're acting both as security provider and an insurance. In Bitcoin, um, there is no, uh, there is no, what I'll say, legally established um, architecture for that. Rather, people make their own choices. And so I, I don't know that um, there's kind of the beginnings of some of this. So for example, uh, there's a there's a system called Open Bazaar, which is a uh, a marketplace mm -hmm. uh, system. And in Open Bazaar, when you uh, sell something as a seller, you can um, you can opt into having moderators who moderate the payments. And so here you have a decentralized system in which you have opted into having an arbitrator of your choice. When the buyer buys in, they know who the moderator is. So they they've um, it's almost like a it's almost like a la carte um, law. Right. So, in in the in the existing um, legal system, you have a court system, which is the state's court system. But there's also mediation services that you can opt into. And so, we're starting to see the beginnings of the same thing in Bitcoin in this context of selling online. Another thing would be um, multi-sig. So, uh, your listeners are probably familiar with the concept of multi-sig. You can have a wallet that requires some combination of signers in order to move funds around. I feel like the multi-sig experience could be handled entirely on mobile devices. So I would love to I would love to have, for example, what I call a family Bitcoin wallet, where my wife and I each have our own keys on our own phones, our kids have their own keys on their own phones. In order for the kids to spend, if they sign and one of us sign, it spends until the kids are ready to handle their own funds, in which case then they, they move them into their own wallet. But then all of us are backups so that, you know, three of four are, or three of five or whatever are, are able to recover funds if one of us loses our funds. You know what I mean? There's, there's a way to set up a whole family environment entirely on mobile devices, communicating with QR codes to set up the, the XPubs and whatnot in such a way that doesn't bewilder the user. Because from a user perspective, you don't need to know about all that stuff. All that you need to know is you're setting up a family wallet. Here's what you need to do. You need to, you know, press this button, scan this code, you know, and you know what I mean, name, name the keys and all that. So I feel like that experience is not quite there, but I don't think there's any reason why you have to make it more complicated than a family of people that collectively um, work together to set up a, a multi-sig wallet. I think the family unit is a natural way to create multi-sig environments where you have multiple people that each have a part of the mm -hmm. uh, a part of the, the signing material. I mean, what the multi-sig, uh, a simple multi-sig is concerned, I mean, it's already there, like by Casa now, with my criticism laid aside, just, you know, just let's not go into that because I think, and a, a lot of Bitcoiners agree with me, it's uh, the, the annual fee for the Casa simple multi-sig, it's just uh, relatively um, a little bit you know, it could be lower. It just could be lower or handled differently. But you know, it could be a more adequate price. Uh, but it's going into that direction. If it's not cars, it's going to be any other competitor that's that will you know outbeat them with a much much even smoother and uh, UX and and uh, you know uh, different functionalities and options. Um, so. Um, Jim, but you talk about somewhere in your book, like uh, the, you 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 post a question, the the effects of Bitcoin on the future organization of human affairs. Okay. Because I want to go it, into a specific direction with you. I'm I'm trying to push you here. Like, um, would you say that you know when I ask my my guests on my show, like, okay, where do you see you know? Uh, our human society, or now that I had some talks also with Jeff Booth and Tito Skebel, um, it becomes much more concrete for me what, what you know, the, the visualization of, of our really imminent future, whether it been five years, 10 years, or whatever, in 20 years, um, would that be really speculative? I mean, either we have a conviction or co and comprehension 
uh, when we, you know, pull in, when we connect all the dots, you know, like uh, rooted, like uh, a human civilization, human society, free private city, citadel city, whatever you want to call it, rooted in Bitcoin with a deflation economics, deflation technology, free market principles, even a defensive, pure defensive technology to, you know, to be prepared for aggressors, <laughs> starting with the state, uh, nation state governments uh, and central banks. But do you have like a concrete vision, a concrete like understanding what the future could realistically look like without going into any kind of utopian, dystopian or sci-fi? <laughs> really, that's all? Oh, yeah, no problem. That no, sounds good. Um, well, I, there's a couple of different ways you could you could approach that question. And I have a couple of different ideas. Unfortunately, I wasn't writing them down just now, so I might forget. But um, one thing I would say is in the medium term, uh, children, I think, are an uh, underappreciated uh, part of the network. So um, I've been paying my kids their allowance in Bitcoin uh, since I fell into the rabbit hole in 2017. Um, they awesome. Have their, yeah, they have their own wallet. Yeah, on-chain and everything, right? So uh, they have their own wallets. I'm willing to switch to Lightning when I can figure out how to make that work smoothly for them. Um, the UX of that is not, I mean, I haven't had a great experience with Lightning yet, but it's just newer. So anyway, but I've been paying them on-chain Bitcoin allowance for a couple of years now. And they're like, well, dad, how do I spend this? And I was like, I don't know, figure it out. Right. And so then they did. And uh, they use, uh, they use bit refill to purchase um, gift cards for uh, things they want to use. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> they'll occasionally, uh, they'll occasionally, ask me to like cash out some of their Bitcoin, but they rode the whole wave, you know? So for years there, my son was like, you know, Bitcoin only goes down, dad. Like, well, yeah, it did in 2018, uh, but it doesn't always go down, you know? <laughs> now it goes up. Yeah, he was recently struggling with whether or not to buy a, a VR headset. And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I don't know what price is going to do. I don't know if you're going to be unhappy that you overpaid now or not, I, you, you, but you got to live your life. The fact that you're struggling with that is an experience I want you to have at your age, because I never had that experience when I was when I was a kid. Um, I just spent money whenever I got it, and it was the right thing to do because money doesn't hold any value, but it does for my kids. So, my children have never known a world without Bitcoin. Their entire world has been that. They have tried to use PayPal, and it's incredibly difficult for them because they can't KYC, and then they get shut down, and blah blah blah. They, they don't have any access to traditional banking, but they're perfectly fine buying things on the internet. And they love when they see that something accepts Bitcoin because then they can just buy it directly. My son was really upset when Steam discontinued um, uh, Bitcoin payments because he couldn't use it anymore. And I was like, well, now I got to go get like Steam gift cards or whatever from some random place. Um, so I think children are an underappreciated uh, market segment. And I would encourage Bitcoiners, if they're comfortable doing so, to start paying their kids a Bitcoin allowance and then just tell the kids to figure it out because they will. They'll figure out how to spend it. How do I spend Bitcoin on the internet? They'll search it up. They'll figure out how to do it. Um, so for them, the other thing that can, the other key thing to keep in mind for the medium term is, you know, 10 years from now, we're all going to be 10 years older, including our kids. And the people who are already old, some of them aren't going to be part of the economy anymore, right? And so things when you try to project into the future, you have to also account for the fact that 20 years in the future, a 20 year old is being born right now. That person is a different person than the 20 year olds of today. 20 year olds today are gonna to be 40 in 20 years, right? So you have to, you have to scale that all forward. So for, for, young, for kids today, Bitcoin has always been, it has always existed, it has always been part of our, part of our um, world. And so they'll have no problem at all adopting it um, from, a, from a financial standpoint. Um, as far as like the arrangement of human affairs, I think one example that I'll give um, that, that I thought of is uh, a Bitcoin pension fund. <clears throat> so if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the growth of something like the, the S&P 500 over the last 40 years since, the, since we got off the gold standard, it yields about 6 or 8% six or year over year, but with wild fluctuations in the, in the total price. And you have all of these big pension funds that are invested in that because they're, they're chasing yield wherever they can find it. That, but if you if you map that against, say, the M2 money supply or M1 or M0, it doesn't matter. Take your pick of the money supply. It's it's virtually the same curve without all of the without all of the um, the fluctuations. So my my claim is, if you could buy a share of all money, it should grow at the rate of M2 or M1 in terms of the value of real stuff. 
which is roughly what the stock market produces minus the difference, which is about 2%, which is the growth rate. So my, my hypothesis is that the S&P 500 index represents what the value would be of a fixed share of all money if you could have such a thing, which you couldn't back in the day. But if you could have a, a you could if you could have a share of USD, it's like this is my share of all future USD. If you could have that, that's what the S and P is plus growth. So in the Bitcoin future, I project that there will still be investment. There will still be people who want to receive a return in Bitcoin terms, right? But the interest free rate is zero. The interest free rate is just holding Bitcoin. But that Bitcoin should appreciate at roughly the same rate of growth of, of, of as other people are investing and producing new stuff, the value of your Bitcoin should grow. So what this means from a Bitcoin pension fund prospect is one could imagine a scenario where every time that you're, as you're working, you're paying into a Bitcoin uh, pension fund, which is some kind of a multi-sig setup that has some sort of adjudication. We, we can, you know, that's, that's implementation details. But the point is, is that you have some share of a pension fund and that's yours. And then as you get to the end of your life, sorry, as you get to the end of your working life, you start drawing from the pension fund, but the amount that you draw is a fraction of it. And the value that you receive from that increases over time in terms of goods and services as people continue, you know, as humanity continues to produce new and better stuff. So you ought to never have to run out of your pension fund in, in old age. But if you happen to live an extraordinarily long life, that's what you're buying insurance against. So the pension fund, as the fund manager, they get uh, some fraction, they get some fee for, for their services. And then if you live an extraordinarily long life beyond what you had planned for, then you start drawing out of their funds. So the pension fund basically becomes like an insurance. They, they, their job is to predict how long you're likely to live so that I can take enough fees so that if you overstay, you know, if you, if you want to draw further. And then if at any time the pension fund is at risk of uh, dissolving, everybody can take out their remaining funds. Like it's like, you know, we can, we can undo it. Again, this is very hand wavy. The point that I'm trying to make though, is that currently pension funds have to, um, currently the, the, fate of a pension fund is tied to the performance of a market index such as the S&P or maybe the Russell 3000 or something. And that puts everybody at risk. It means that the stock market is too big to fail. It means that the Fed's going to bail them out. But in a Bitcoin future, none of that would be the case. It would just be like, I have money and then I can draw against it. And what I'm buying by being part of the pension is insurance against an, ex an extraordinarily long life, which I think would work out pretty well. That would be an example of something that I think would be a change to the way human affairs are run uh, in a Bitcoin future. Yeah, uh, fascinating. So you, you talk about like this intersubjective value, like like thinking, I don't know, there's this 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 pretty uh, famous, uh, you know, Neo and Morpheus matrix uh, meme, where he's where Morpheus says, you know, you won't have to think uh, or, or something like that. It's about like, you will, th I mean, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is that I think the transformational shift in thinking in terms of satoshis in the unit of account is so profound that uh, people don't even, I think, un even understand the real potential of the purchasing power of Bitcoin once this, whatever you would call it, you know, once the crash comes. I just read the article by Dr. Marcus Krull, whom I had on my show. He's a German, like non-mainstream expert. And he says the, the dollar is going to, you know, survive still, you know, much, much longer than the euro. The euro, he says, is going to crash by, by whatever, um, by next year, 2021, by spring 2021, because the senior Raj capital will be, will, will highly, you know, exceedingly, you know, exceed the, what do you want to call it, you know, the, the gross da domestic product or, uh, you know, it just over the indebtedness and insolvencies will come. So I think we just, the, it's the quiet before the storm and just so many parameters now playing simultaneously at a pace we can't even fathom um, globally, macroeconomically. Like, w what is your take on that? Like, do you see like uh, converging everything to a, to a much faster reset without, you know, all the you know, feared uh, disruptions and and um, chaos? Um, that's a really good question. So what I'll say is I think it takes time for people to change their minds on things. As I mentioned, I, I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011 and didn't fall into the rabbit hole until 2017. So it took me roughly six years of observing Bitcoin at a distance to decide that I was ready to look into it. Um, 
and I, and I was prepared. I mean, I, I had read Creature from Jekyll Island. I, I fully understood the mechanisms of the, the Federal Reserve Treasury system. I understood the mechanisms of money creation. I understood the nature of banking. I understood the money multiplier effect. Like I had all of that in my, my repertoire before hearing about Bitcoin, and it took me six years to decide you know, that this was, this was real. Um, so I can't expect people to take any less time. So I first heard about Bitcoin in 2011. I first got interested in it in 2012. I first bought some in 2013, so it took me several years. There's a whole class of future Bitcoiners that only just heard about it in 2017. Like, oh, wow, what's that, what's that thing all about, right? It's going to take another round or two before they're ready to, to really look into it deeply. So I, I don't think there's any way to, to make it faster for people than that. Um, then you just have, they just have to take it slow. Um, as far as the macroeconomics are concerned, I, I tried to read an analysis recently of like bond yields over time and it was talking about this. And I just, I can't even read economic analyses anymore because their unit of account is garbage. Like I, yeah, yeah. they're basing it on fiat currency. And I'm like, well, you're, you're using a measure that is infinite. You know, they, they, they can make as much of it as they want at any time. They can perform any operation they like. The only thing that's stopping them is the, the illusion that, that somebody could stop them. That's it. But they can do whatever they want. So, to me, to me, it, what what it's going to take is people waking up to the fact that there's only two scarce things: time and Bitcoin. Everything else they can make more of. People will say, "Oh, well, what about land? Land is so valuable." I'm like, drive in any direction. There's land everywhere. Yeah, right? exactly. Look, look uh -huh. up. There's all kinds of undeveloped sky. Like, yeah. And, There's you know, I always have to laugh when we, people talk about, you know, all these fear mongers about like, oh, we are overpopulated. I mean, beginning with Bill Gates, you know, I mean, we could easily, you know, pack th pro at least 30 to 40 billion people on this planet because there's so much space. It's just a lack of technology and, and technological innovation, especially zero to one innovation. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think we haven't nearly begun to use the, the resources available on this planet. I, lo I love those estimates where they say, you know, we use roughly one ten thousandth of the energy that the sun bathes the planet in every day. So that just shows you that we have like plenty of room to grow. I mean, a tablespoon of seawater has enough deuterium to, to do yeah, fusion exactly. reactions yeah, to power thanks. all of humans' yeah. projected needs for uh -huh. hundreds and hundreds of years. <laughs> what we what we lack is just uh, experience and, and imagination. We we don't we don't there's no lack of resources. Resources are are vast, but they're not gonna make any more Bitcoin. Right? They're not making any more Bitcoin. And so I think it's going to take people a little while to adopt that mentality. Uh, but at some point, people are just going to question like, oh, let, let, me, let me say something else. Let me say something else, uh, if you don't mind. So people talk about diversification as a strategy, like, oh, I should diversify my investments. And the question is, well, why diversify? And the reason you diversify your investments is because you're trying to smooth out the yield. You, you know, if one of your investments goes down, you want other investments to go up, and that's the purpose of diversification. But the objective here is to reduce the variance of your returns, right? And but the reason why people are forced to do that is because the money itself is bad. What I really want is money because money is, you know, stored time. It's my ability to to purchase things in the future. But I can't hold money because the money is bad. So I have to diversify. So all of this built-in knowledge about diversification is predicated on a world of bad money. But in a world of good money, you don't need to diversify anymore. So there are a lot of assets that I think are overvalued right now simply because people are looking for some way to diversify. So like, oh, well, if, I, if I'm a wealthy individual and I already have a bunch of the index and I already we have a bunch of government debt. What else can I do? Well, I can buy I can buy a uh, an apartment in Singapore, and I can buy an apartment in London, right? And at least that way, now I've got some real estate exposure in different places. I'm not even going to live in those places. I'm just going to store. And all of that is to ch is to get out of the fact that the money itself is bad. Um, so I think all of that is uh, un unnecessary. But to your point about like you know debt to GDP ratio and all that, it's the the numbers are all made up. It's it's exactly. I just. The GDP numbers made up. The the, um, the the minute you try to look into any of these numbers that these economists use, you you start to find cracks in the system. My favorite one to pick on, with I picked on a little bit in the book, is the CPI. Uh, you know, yeah, they're totally to manipulated. It's totally false. I mean, what, what, what? This is ridiculous. I mean, we have been fooled for such a long time with this stupid CPI index. You know. Exactly. Yeah. So the the CPI. Um, I I mean, your your listeners are probably totally aware, but the CPI is the uh, representation of what a basket of, of goods is supposed to cost. 
but it can't possibly account for new goods that never previously existed. So for example, there's internet now. There didn't used to be internet. How do you account for that in your basket of goods? Do you account for it at all, right? It, there's just no way to account for it. And then, and then of course, they, they alter what things mean. Well, somebody buys meat. Well, is there a difference between steak and you know ground beef? Well, maybe there is or maybe there isn't, but it's up to the CPI folks to decide what goes in and what doesn't. And they have political incentives to make the numbers work out in a particular way. So anyway, the numbers are all made up. Uh, and so I, I can't even look at those analyses. What I can look at is Bitcoin because one BTC equals one BTC. And I know that, and there's never going to be more than 21 million. And my friends were like, well, how do you know? I'm like, because I say so. My node says so. Like, they're not going <laughs> to... Exactly. <laughs> I'm never going to transact on a network that suddenly has more than 21 million. That's all there's ever going to be because I say so. Mm -hmm. You know, so and there's others like me. Yeah, maybe it's good time now that we, you know, we can wrap it, wrap this pretty nicely up, um, uh, Jim. So the absolute, you know, the essence of Bitcoin is is the absolute and total scarcity of Bitcoin. Now, I think people still have a difficult time it's like with risk assessment or you know projecting or, or you know understanding like the future or you know there are some things where we as human beings are really bad at so um but let's you know maybe recapitulate there are approximately 47 million millionaires on this planet and there are I think I have read something, a number about billionaires, something like 2,000 something, 2,400, 2,500 billionaires, maybe a little bit less. And we got around like 8 billion people. Like, do you want to like, you know, um, uh, put this into, uh, into a perspective? Like we got in total 21 million where three to 4 million, uh, most probably has already been lost or sort of out of circulation forever. Like, do you want to put this into perspective for people? Uh, sure. So I, I think what you're getting at is that, um, you know, if Bitcoin was evenly distributed, if everyone that is projected to be born within the next, you know, few decades would get an equal amount of Bitcoin, it would work out to something like the equivalent of $20 worth today. Like you could buy your share of global wealth for $20 uh, at current exchange rates um, and, and projected uh, population growth. Um, it's like 0 0.002. Uh, mm -hmm. in change, give or take, um, Bitcoin. So it's not like, it's not a difficult thing to try to get your proportion, but of course it won't be evenly distributed, nothing ever is. Um, so yeah, pe people are not, um, it, it's gonna be very small amounts of Bitcoin. Like we're gonna need uh, other ways of scaling it than doing everything on chain. I think everybody agrees that uh, on chain scaling is not, is not gonna handle all of everyone's um, use cases, but that's okay because people create credit arrangements all the time. Like it's kind of a human human nature thing. Anytime, you know, you go to a restaurant, there's a there's a credit arrangement there where they're crediting you by giving you the food until you pay at the end, you know, hoping that you don't walk out on them. So uh, credit arrangements are not going away even in a Bitcoin future. Um, but I think there'd be a whole lot less of it because you can have the thing itself. Right. So after, yeah. uh, you know, um, uh, Paul Tudor Jones called Bitcoin the fastest race, uh, the fastest <laughs> horse in the race. And now, you know, uh, Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy, all of a sudden, you know, uh, making 180 degrees turn from 2013, where he called it like, you know, work called Bitcoin, the numbers are accounted or something like that, or the, the days are going to be over or something like that. And then all of a sudden he puts like a half of the excess cash reserves into Bitcoin. And now more and more companies are like secretly in the board meetings Jeff both even talked about it on some shows I think with Preston Preston Pish like do you see like the chain reaction has already been triggered like in in family offices pension funds where this career risk is also also been being sort of uh, uh, you know the burden has been sort of taken off of there in their in their decision-making process or, or power um, to allocate yeah the yeah, I think I think it's starting. I think you're seeing some of that. I think the real the real flip will be when people start to demand answers from their uh, mm -hmm. funds. Why didn't you do this? <laughs> yeah. Your competitors did this. Why didn't you? Like, how did you miss this? Right? And then those people get fired and get replaced by other people who say, "No, we're committed to holding some amount of Bitcoin forever." Blah blah blah. Right? So I think it'll take a little while. It's going to take <laughs> it's going to take those early few being incredibly right for everyone to demand that everyone else uh, follow suit. I think that's the chain reaction, is during the next uh, epic bull run, when everyone's like, 
how how can you justify missing out on this? <laughs> right. So, Jimbo, yeah, um, do you want to like, is there anything we've missed or I should have maybe mentioned, uh, especially in connection with your book, when is it going to come out, when is it going to be published, uh, when do you plan like to write uh, the other three, four like uh, parts of the series of your book, uh, where is it going to be published, like anything I've missed? Yeah, those are those are really great questions. So um, as I mentioned before, my first book is really for pre-coiners. Um, I, I thank you for your kind words about how uh, Bitcoiners might also benefit from it. But I was really trying to find a way to phrase Bitcoin in a way that appealed to, um, you know, a, a more general audience. So that, that's what I felt like was missing. I feel like there's really great work out there that already exists that uh, speaks to people who are already liberty and, and uh, freedom minded, but it didn't really see a lot of stuff out there to explain it to everyone else. So that, that was kind of my goal. And as we mentioned before also, um, people kind of go through these phases where you first hear about Bitcoin and then a long time goes by and then you hear about it again. So I think there's a, so my readership, the people that I really hope to reach with the first book aren't here yet. Right now they're ignoring Bitcoin because 2020 is giving them other things to think about. I don't know. I mean, other people think about things other than Bitcoin. I don't get it, but other people do. Um, and so they're right now they're, they're busy thinking about the U.S. presidential election or coronavirus or the stock market or Tesla or whatever else people are interested in. I think uh, once all of that dies down, um, which it may, you know, it may not be until sometime next year, then I think people might have room in their consciousness to reevaluate Bitcoin. And especially once Bitcoin, once Bitcoin reaches, uh, you know, new all-time highs or, or, or approaches new all-time highs, that's when you're going to get people saying like, wait, that thing didn't just die in 2018. It's still around. And now it's like higher than it ever was then. That's <laughs> now I should really look into that. That, that moment is when I want my book to be available because Th those are the people that I want to talk to. Um, so I'm, my current plan is to hit the publish button around uh, 18,000. So around 18K, whenever we hit that, that's when I'll probably flip the, the publish button on, um, on uh, Amazon. I, was, I, I have it set up as, an, as a Kindle uh, direct publishing book. Um, I have a little bit more work to do to make it ready for a uh, Kindle version. But the paperback can go live any moment. So whenever we hit 18K, I'll make it go live. In the meantime, I am trying to figure out how to uh, do hardcovers, um, uh, publishing those myself. I'm not working with a publisher or anything. I'm just right. doing no, this No, you could do own. that yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So I'm trying to figure out a way to make limited edition hardcovers that are available through Open Bazaar or perhaps through some other uh, venue. Because mm -hmm. I'd like to make the hardcovers available to Bitcoiners who care about you know Bitcoin. Right. If you want the paperback, then you go to Amazon and pay fiat like everybody else great so um yeah um anything uh, where, where can people find you like yep uh on twitter and telegram i am at jimbo coin uh that's pretty much my only uh net exposure right now all right now before uh we wrap up um we just still want to ask you uh did you like uh, send your pdf version to maybe more prominent Bitcoin, whatever, like real like experts in Bitcoin, like did they give you a feedback or, or have you received any feedback? Yeah, um, so I tried to solicit feedback from uh, some more prominent Bitcoiners and so far I haven't really gotten much. I am very uh, grateful to the Taco Carnivore Bitcoin Club, so mm -hmm. several of them have read uh, and given me feedback. Um, and, and then my, my friends that I've known, um, outside of outside of the Bitcoin world. But uh, unfortunately, no, I have not had a great success with getting feedback from the um, the Bitcoin uh, Twitterati, as it were. Okay, but I think once you go like, you know, publishing on, on Amazon and you have it, whatever, as, an, as a Kindle version and or as a hardcover ver version, I think you're gonna have much more traction and, and you know, and, and reflection maybe from other people because I'm real curious what other people are going to say. But, you know, I find it, I find your book excellent. You know, it's just, as I said, you know, whether it's a pre-coiner, no-coiner, or undecided one, or a bitcoiner, it's a, it's a you know, huge inspirational educational book you wrote, written. So oh, well, thank you. Yeah. That's, yeah. Very, that's very kind of you to say, uh, you know. Um, I, I think that I, the thing, the thing that really, unfortunately, I think the key insight maybe that, that I can, I'm happy to give your, your, your listeners is um, Bitcoin is three things. It's not just, you know, people people are like, well, what is Bitcoin? Well, it's really three things. It's 
a digital money, like a programmable, consensual digital money. It's also a network of computers that secures that money. But then most importantly, the third thing is, it's a community of people that uphold that network and enforce the rules by running their own nodes. Those three things. And so when people say, well, how can this thing have value at all? And the answer is, value is always and everywhere a subjective appraisal. There's that saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Value is the same way. Value requires somebody who's subjectively appraising that something has value. So the reason that Bitcoin has value is because people say that it does. I know that sounds a little bit circular, but that's ultimately all value. All value is that way. Um, so I'm hoping to explain that to, to pre-coiners so that when they come in here and they're skeptical and they're like, ah, it sounds like some kind of digital money scam thing. It's like, no, no, there's a community here. And the reason this is, this gets into like the second book. So some people say like, okay, well, if Bitcoin's so successful, how come the government's not just going to shut it down? How come they're not just going to make their own coin? How do you know it's not going to be replaced by some other technology? And the answer to all of that is you can fork the code, you can copy the blockchain, but you can't copy the people the people of bitcoin is what yeah. makes bitcoin you know what it is and you can't copy i mean not copy but it it it, 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 it it's uh, inadvertently like tied to the monetary properties it's you know it's the fixed monetary you know eternal properties whether that is you know the absolute scarcity the decentralized the decentralized nature nature the liquidity the network effect Everything that's already you know, where we can say that where we can say the cat is off the back. Pandora's box been you know uh, open a long time ago. It's too late, you know, to to like you know suffocate it. They should have done it like you know at the very beginning, uh, at the genesis maybe. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's a really good point. And some people will say like, well, what about new technology? Like, what about what about some, what if some new technology comes along and and it, and Bitcoin doesn't have it? And my answer to that is any technology that's good enough, Bitcoin can adopt. Bitcoin's existing ledger plus new technology is always better than new technology plus some other shitcoin. Like exactly. there's no, yeah. there, there's yeah. no reason not to adopt it. And if Bitcoin doesn't adopt it, then it wasn't good enough by definition, right? So it's kind of like the internet. Somebody says like, what if there's a better internet that comes along? It's like, well, any communication technology you come up with is better on the internet. It's better to figure out how to communicate over TCP IP than to create a whole separate network. Like, anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, Jimbo, I'd love to have you back sometime soon in the very near future, maybe in a panel discussion with other Bitcoiners if you're open-minded to that. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for you know taking your time and it was a uh, really uh, thrilling and inspiring talk with you, really educational for my listeners. And yeah, talk to you soon. Anytime, happy to have you. Thanks so thanks. much. Okay, Jimbo, bye-bye. All right. So, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, please give it a like, subscribe, uh, retweet it, share it, uh, whatever you do. It would really appreciate, re really appreciate uh, supporting me. And uh, please uh, write a positive review, subscribe on my podcast platforms, any kind of podcast platform, go to iTunes, give me a positive five-star rating, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to support me in any shape or form, whether it be Satoshi's or Fiat still, PayPal or uh, tipping, uh, platform uh, or my pay name uh, somewhere I wallet address you can send me a few satoshi so I can you know continue my independent uh, research investigative uh, work and uh, my podcast shows the total connector total Bitcoin podcast show my name is Kevin Davani thanks so much again stack sats and be careful out there uh, security and privacy comes first and uh, you know things are getting better and better in terms of UX user experience you know uh, ease of use uh, and uh, yeah share the news and uh, spread the information and uh, it, you know I think monetary evolution is right you know knocking at our door we just need to open the door all right my name is Kevin Navani I'll talk to you soon thank you so much bye